Good evening from Chicago. I'm Chris Hayes. Today, President Joe Biden is in Brussels for a series of high-stakes meetings with world leaders and an emergency gathering of NATO amidst the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. The allies at those meetings agreed to provide Ukraine with equipment to deal with a possible chemical, biological, or nuclear attack, and they announced a new round of sanctions on Russian members of parliament and defense companies. A month into Russia's unprovoked war in Ukraine, Biden and European allies are trying to show a united front as they work to increase the pressure on Russian President Vladimir Putin. If you step back from all the day-to-day -day devastation happening in Ukraine, it is impossible to not see this as a pivotal moment in history. This is the first time in the 30-some years since the end of the Cold War that we have come to think of as the global order is being utterly transformed. I was 10 years old when the Berlin Wall fell in November 1989, the beginning of the end of communism in Eastern Europe. I still remember being on summer break when the failed Soviet coup happened in 1991, the last gasp of the Soviet Communist Party. This has been an extraordinary day in the Soviet Union, where Mikhail Gorbachev has been ousted from power. In what appears to have been a bloodless coup, hardliners have seized power and declared a state of emergency. Armored columns of troops have taken up positions throughout the Soviet Union, and Mikhail Gorbachev is said to be under house arrest at his vacation home in the Crimea. At the moment, tanks line the streets of Moscow, and there have been demonstrations and some gunfire, though no reports of any injuries. Boris Yeltsin, the president of the Republic of Russia, is at the center of what resistance there is. He has called on his people to resist the emergency committee, and he's urged an immediate general strike. That coup was defeated in a matter of days. The Communist Party collapsed and the Soviet Union dissolved within months. Former Soviet republics, including Ukraine, became independent practically overnight. It signaled a massive shift towards freedom and towards democracy. And it began an era, the decade between 1991 and 2001, when liberal democracy was at, at, was at largely uncontested peak. In 1992, American political scientist Francis Fukuyama published a Prussian book titled The End of History and the Last Man. Now, it was widely un misunderstood at the time, but Fukuyama's main point was not that nothing of significance would ever happen again. Obviously, that's ridiculous. Rather, that the emerging global order in the wake of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, the order in which everyone seemed to be converging towards liberal democracy was about as good as it was ever going to get. Fukuyama writes that he, quote, returns to a very old question, whether at the end of the 20th century it makes sense for us once again to speak of a coherent and directional, capital H, history of mankind that will eventually lead the greater part of humanity to liberal democracy. The answer I arrive at is yes. Of course, after the Nazis were defeated in World War II, the main challenge politically, militarily, and ideologically to the liberal capitalist democracies came from communism, headquartered in Russia. And the battle between these two models, between liberal democracy, capitalist democracy, and communism, through the Cold World War, went on to determine the global order for over 30 years, 40 years. That fight defined our world for decades. But as Fukuyama says, with the fall of communism, there was no longer a fundamental ideological challenge to the supremacy of liberal democracy. And so there was, to many, a kind of palpable sense of... Um, drift, decadence by the late 1990s, no great struggle to challenge our way of living. And then, of course, something happened. September 11th happened. And there was a rush almost immediately, and I remember it even on the day itself, to frame those attacks and the war on terror that ensued as a great epochal-defining clash of civilizations, an existential battle for democracy and liberty. Tonight, we are a country awakened to danger and called to defend freedom. This is the world's fight. This is civilization's fight. This is the fight of all who believe in progress and pluralism, tolerance and freedom. We have just completed a century in which militant ideologies were thrown back by the forces of freedom and democracy. We face that kind of threat once again tonight. And once again, we will prevail. It was an attack against civilization. Civilization must respond. That mindset was dominant, even hegemonic, and continued for years. In fact, in 2004, 
Then Democratic presidential candidate John Kerry faced a ton of backlash for how he described what he thought it would take for Americans to feel safe again. He said, quote, we have to get back to the place we were, where terrorists are not the focus of our lives, but they are a nuisance. As a former law enforcement person, I know we're never going to end prostitution. We're no, never going to end illegal gambling, but we're going to reduce it, organize crime to a level where it isn't on the rise. It isn't threatening people's lives every day. And fundamentally, it's something you continue to fight, but it's not threatening the fabric of your life. Just a few days later, then President George W. Bush, running for re-election against Kerry, brought up those precise remarks at a presidential debate, calling them dangerous. Yes, we can be safe and secure if we stay on the offense against the terrorists and if we spread freedom and liberty around the world. My opponent just this weekend talked about how terrorism could be reduced to a nuisance, comparing it to prostitution, illegal gambling. I think that attitude and that point of view is dangerous. I don't think you can secure America for the long run if you don't have a comprehensive view as to how to feed these people. But ultimately, I have to say, and I felt this way at the time, but really feel it now, that knowing what we know now, John Kerry was right. <laughs> Conservatives and the Bush administration massively overinflated the importance of al-Qaeda and, fundamentally, the ideological challenge they posed. It was insane, frankly, to alter our lives the way we did, to divert the kind of resources we diverted to fighting them. We spent trillions of dollars, lost thousands of Americans, not to mention tens and hundreds of thousands of Afghan and Iraqi lives. It is sickening to think about in those stark terms. And all these people were clearly craving the grand ideological battle of World War II and then subsequently the Cold War. They sunk their teeth into this new fight, even though they were mistaken completely about its scope. In retrospect, it is clear the fight against al-Qaeda was not an era-defining worldwide battle for hearts and minds wasn't a fundamental challenge to the global order or to liberal democracy as we know it. And that experience, that false rush to frame things as a kind of civilizational battle, has made me very skeptical of any sort of framework for understanding global affairs as a battle for freedom versus tyranny. But I have to say, now, I think we have arrived at the kind of epochal moment that people thought 9-11 was. And it is closing the chapter on the kind of world order that Francis Fukuyama identified. The end of history after the end of the Cold War, liberal democracy ascendant and at its peak. What we have seen over the last several years is the move towards liberal democracy and openness between nations backsliding. We've seen it in Europe with the rise of Hungary's Viktor Orban, who describes himself proudly as an illiberal Democrat, and the United Kingdom with the nationalist and populist forces that pushed for Brexit. Of course, it's been happening right here at home. Donald Trump, frankly, an aspiring authoritarian who admires authoritarians and tried to overturn a free and fair election, still trying to do it. And of course, in Putin's Russia, where his fascist ideology and wounded national pride has turned into a brutal assault on the battlefield. Now, Putin is not only making a completely illegitimate land grab in a misguided attempt to build back the former Soviet empire. He's also committing war crimes in Ukraine, threatening to use nuclear weapons. This new land war on the European continent, pitting a would-be conquering dictator against citizens of a very flawed but resilient democracy, really does feel like the first armed conflict in a new chapter. A sustained battle between liberal democracy and its enemies in the 21st century. We are seeing the entire global order that was built during that Strange period of time, those 30 years after the Cold War sort of fold in on itself. A new Iron Curtain comes down over Russia. The McDonald's and Pushkin Square are going away. The stakes are high and grave. Ukraine has been an independent country for nearly 30 years. It is a flawed but functioning democracy where the people choose their own leader. And they have an authoritarian neighbor who just cannot accept that. Who seems willing to do whatever it takes to destroy it. I think after the pandemic, um, a lot of us thought about going back to normal, some turn around the bend where we get back to something. And I've come to see, both in the pandemic and in the global order, there is no going back to normal now. It's gone. The past is in the past. There is no restoring what was. As deeply imperfect and unequal as that order was, and it was in so many, many ways, 
I've really come to believe the elemental fight to preserve people's ability to govern themselves, to choose their own destinies, is the elemental fight in the era that we have now entered.